So, um, yeah. So I'm Lee. I come from Berlin, and I want to talk to you about fibers. Now, if you don't know anything about fibers, that's fine. That you're in the right town. Uh, you might have heard of the term coroutine. Uh, that's exactly the same. Ruby calls coroutines fibers. Now, this talk has two parts. The first part is the basics, and after the basics, we're going to look into some practical applications of fibers. Uh, that was so part one, basics. Part two, practical applications. So let's dive into the basics. So what I have here is a lambda, an anonymous function that prints giraffe. And so if I call it, the output is giraffe. Now I can replace lambda with fiber.new, and I can replace call with resume and run this piece of code, and this will also add the giraffe. So in a way, the fiber is a bit like a lambda. This is a giraffe, in case you don't know. Uh, let's let's uh, go a bit further. So this is a lambda that prints zebra. Uh, so if I call it, it prints zebra, as you would expect. Now after printing zebra, I can return and then print invisible zebra. So if I call this, it will print just zebra, because after printing zebra, it will have returned. Now I can replace lambda with fiber.new, I can replace call with resume and run this piece of code, then it will print zebra, followed by an unexpected return, local jump error. And the reason for this is that you can't really return from fiber directly, but what you can do is yield the fiber. So in this case, this will print zebra with uh, no, no exception. These are three zebras and an unknown number of the invisible zebras. Um, going further, here's lambda that prints donkey, so if I call it, it prints donkey. Now if I call this lambda twice, then this prints donkey twice, as you might expect. So I can replace lambda with fiber.mu, I can replace uh, call with resume, and I run this piece of code, and it will print donkey, followed by a dead fiber called fiber error. And the reason for this is that once you've run the fiber, or fiber has finished executing, you can't uh, run it anymore, it is, it is spent. Uh, this is a donkey, it's cute. So this is uh, another example where I print kangaroo, then I, then I return, then I print wallaby. So if I call this, it's just prints kangaroo. So if I call this twice, it prints kangaroo twice. Now I can replace lambda with fiber.mu, I can replace uh, return fiber.yield, and I can replace call with resume. And if I run this, then what you see here now is that it will print kangaroo, and then it will print wallaby. And the reason for this is that fiber.yield is sort of a suspension point that marks exactly where a fiber will be paused, where it will be suspended, and where it can also be resumed. And so this slide shows exactly what a fiber is. These are kangaroos. This is a wallaby, but I'm not from Australia, so I really can't tell the difference. Um, so to summarize, you can create a fiber and fiber.new. You can resume a fiber with the resume method, and you can, you can use fiber.yield to return or suspend the fiber. Now, that is not the for to finish, the, it's not the end of part one, not the end of the basics. It's the end of the first half of the basics. So let's continue. So here I have a fiber that prints quokka. So if I resume it, it prints quokka. Now I can uh, call resume with a value, in this case a string quokka, in which case it will be passed in as a block argument to fiber.new. So if I let the, uh, the fiber print that block argument, then it will get quokka uh, printed. This is a cocoa. Cocoa. It is. It is adorable. <laughs> um, let's continue. So this is very similar. I create a fiber that prints the block argument, and I pass in the string Samoyed. Uh, what I can do next is I can. Um, this is very similar to what we had before. So I can resume it the second time, and the second time it will continue off at the fiber.yield, and then I can print Arctic Fox. 
So this whole thing prints Samuel because I passed it in as a block argument, and the second time it just prints archive calls. Now I can change this little piece, little piece of code, and the second time I can pass in Arctic Fox as a string, and then this will be returned uh, by fiber.yield. So whatever I pass into resume, the second, third, and so on times will be returned by the matching fiber.yield call. So this prints Samoyed and Arctic Fox. So this is how you can get data into a fiber. This is Samoyed, which is very white. This is a part of Fox, which is also very white, and this means that they are the same animal. Um, this is a, it's not true. This is a fiber that prints red panda, so if I resume it, it just prints red panda. Um, now, what I can do is I can change this piece of code so that it implicitly returns red panda as a string, and then I can print whatever the resume message returns, and so this will print red panda. So this is one way of getting data out of a fiber. This is a red panda, it's adorable. So here I have a, um, a fiber that prints main coon. So if I resume it, it prints main coon. Um, afterwards, what I can do is I can uh, yield the fiber, then implicitly return raccoon. So if I resume it, then the second time I resume it, I print the return value. This prints main coon and raccoon. Now I can also explicitly yield the string main coon by passing into fiber.yield. And so this will be printed first, and then secondly it will be uh, it will print whatever was implicitly returned, which is raccoon. So this whole thing prints main coon followed by raccoon. Um, they they sound very similar, but they look very different because of the main coon, which is very majestic, and this is the raccoon, which is not majestic at all. So to summarize, uh, this, at this point there are no more anime pictures, so you've had your chance. So to summarize, you can create a fiber with fiber.view, you can resume a fiber with fiber.resume, uh, you can pass things in, get things out, and finally, you can use fiber.view to suspend or return from the fiber. So that is it for the basics. Let's now take a look at some practical applications, and I have three uh, for, for you. The first one is generators. So Ruby has arrays. As you know, you can iterate over them using the each method, you pass the block, which will be executed for every element in that array. So this prints seven, two, and four. Now, arrays are not the only enumerable thing. You can also make anything enumerable. For example, I can create a people directory where I define some constants for some inspirational women in computer science, and then I can implement an each method which will su successively yield the three constants that I've defined. And then I can create my people directory, and I can call each on it, pretending that it is an array, even though it isn't. And so if I then, uh, this way I can print each element in this people directory, even though it is not an array. All right, still no fibers, hold on. Let's write a linear congruential generator. This is fancy speak for a certain type of random number generator, or more precisely, a pseudo-random number generator. And the way I'll implement it is by defining a bunch of constants that some very smart people have come up with. I don't understand um, how they came up with it, but it works. I'll initialize it with a certain value, a certain seed. Then I can implement next, which will calculate a new value based on the existing value, the constants a, c, and m. And now I can create my linear congruential generator. It's very difficult to say this multiple times. Uh, I can create my random number generator with a certain seed value, and then call next and next and next on it, and this will spit out more and more and more random numbers. Now, I find that a random number generator is a little bit like an infinite array, an infinite list of random numbers. So in a certain way, it makes sense to implement each on it. And so if I were to implement each, I can have it loop, I can I let it calculate the next value, and then yield the value that I've calculated. Now, infinite loops are not particularly useful, 
But in Ruby, if you have a class that implements the each method, then you can let it include the enumerable module, which makes a handful of really interesting methods available. So if I now construct this linear congruential generator, then I can call methods on it, such as take, or map, or select, or zip, and more. And so if I call, for example, take with number three, then this will return the next uh, three random numbers in an array. So this is pretty useful, but we're still not talking about fibers. So let's look, take a look at how we can do this with fibers. So I'll define my constants, my magic constants. I'll have a function make underscore random number generator with a certain value, which will be our C value. This will return a new fiber. And in that fiber, I will loop. I will calculate the next value based on the current value, as well as the constants m, a, and c. And then I will yield that value using fiber.yield. And so now, I can create my random number generator. And every time I call resume, it will print another random number. Hold on. This pattern is so common in Ruby that there is an abstraction built on top of this, which is enumerator. So what you can do is you can replace fiber.new with enumerator.new, which gives a block argument. And instead of calling fiber.yield, you call yield on that specific block argument. And instead of resuming, at the end, you call next instead. Um, but the nice thing about this is that an enumerator, which is built on fibers, also is enu uh, an, enu uh, an enumerator is enumerable, which makes a bunch of interesting methods available that I mentioned earlier, such as take. So if I say take two, then hey, you get the next two random numbers. So this is one practical application of fibers, which is a way to generate dynamically calculated potentially infinite lists. So I call them generators, but Ruby calls generators enumerators. You have generators in other languages, so they basically mean the same thing. Number two is resumable computation. So I'm the author and the maintainer of NAV, which is a static site generator. It's quite old, still maintained. Um, it has its 12th anniversary either this month or next month. And so it's, it's aimed to be flexible and powerful, but in essence what it does is it takes your markdown pages and converts them to HTML. You can have other input formats and other output formats as well, but markdown and HTML is the most common one. At the core, there is a function called compile. What this compile function will do is it will take all your pages, stick them in a priority queue, and until that queue is empty, it will take the next element of that queue and pass it to the compile page function. So graphically, you have a bunch of <coughs> you have a bunch of pages, and all of them get compiled uh, to HTML to your Morgan pages at the top. Now, I mentioned that NAV is powerful, and one of the things that it can do, this is not the most powerful thing, but what it can do is that one page include the compiled content of another page, like this. And the way we implement this is we have a compiled content of the function, which returns the compiled content of the page that we requested. Now, there's a problem with this because it might be that the page of which, uh, whose compiled content you are requesting is not yet compiled. And so the only reasonable thing that we can do at this point is raise an exception. So if the content is not yet available, we raise an exception. This exception, this missing dependency error, this one we have to handle somewhere else, which will be in the compile method that I showed earlier. And so instead of just calling compile on the square page, we have to wrap this in a begin rescue end block, 
So if this missing dependency error occurs, what we have to do is we have to take that page and stick it back into the queue because it has not yet been compiled. Secondly, we have to take the page um, with whose compiled content was missing and prioritize that. So that it, that page gets compiled first uh, before the page that we just tried to compile. So visually, it looks something like this. We have our Morgan pages, and at some point, um, at the, they compile the second page, it tries to access content from a third page that hasn't been compiled yet. At that point, we raise an exception. Don't throw stuff around. Uh, we raise an exception, undo our work, and then we end up uh, compiling the third page. And then finally, we compile the second page, or give it the second page another try. It refer references compiled from the that is now available, and we succeed. And so this is not ideal, because um, I don't like raising exceptions and undoing work. So what I would like to do instead is the following. Page gets compiled, second page tries to re reference compiled content that is not yet available. At this point, I want to suspend the compilation of that second page. I suspend it, I continue with the compilation of that third page, and then finally, I can resume the compiling, the compilation of that second page. And so I mentioned the word um, resume, re uh, suspending and resuming, and as you might have guessed, because this is a talk about fibers, this is exactly where I will use fibers for. And so for every page, I will create one fiber. So I have a function called fiber4, which returns fiber for that given page, creating it if it does not yet exist. Let's take a look at a compile function once again. So in here, instead of calling compile page, I will get the fiber for that page, creating it if it doesn't exist yet, and resume that fiber or start it for the first time. Now, the compiled content of function, it used to raise an exception, but we don't want to have that exception anymore. And instead, when the compiled content is not yet available, what we'll do is we will yield the fiber. We'll say, this fiber is, is a can continue, with, along with some information about what kind of missing dependency that is. Everything that you pass to fiber.yield will be returned by the matching fiber resume method call. So in this case, resume, uh, sorry, result might be exactly that missing dependency information. And if it is, what we do is we stick the page that we're currently compiling back into the queue because it is not yet compiled. And finally, we also uh, prioritize the page for which we need the compiled content. And believe it or not, that is everything we need to do. Because this loop will keep on looping, and eventually the page that failed to be properly compiled is going to be picked up again. We will get the fiber for that page, we will resume it, at which point it will resume exactly where fiber.yield left off. And at that point, we know that the other page that, uh, of which we need to compile content is going to be compiled already because we prioritized it, and then the, the function will just keep on running from that point on. The first time I saw this, this blew my mind. <laughs> this is how we get resumable computation with fibers. I have one more example, which is non blocking IO, which is by far the biggest example. Yeah. So what I'll do in this example is I will build a very simple link checker. I'll have a list of URLs, and for each URL, I will make an HTTP request and check the response code. And if that response is a 200, then great. Otherwise, not so great. And I have three versions of the implementation for this. The first version is sequential, so what I'll do is I'll take my list of URLs, for each URL I'll make an HTTP request, 
with net HTTP, it's fine. I get the response. I check whether the response code is 200, and if it isn't, I will say this is a bad request. Now, this is not the best link checker because it doesn't follow redirects and so on, of course, but uh, that's, that's something that we can deal with later. So this version works, but it's not very efficient because if you imagine that you have 60 URLs, each request, say, let's, let's say it takes one second, then this will take an entire minute to run. We can do better with threads, among other things. But let's do threads first. So this is our original code, and we'll wrap the handling of each URL in a thread. So you say thread.new with a block. Now, this is not yet uh, finished because we need to collect all of those threads. Then each of those threads, we have to call join so that we wait for all these threads to be finished. Uh, join waits for the set to be finished before we exit the program. And so this version is quite a bit faster because instead uh, of taking 60 seconds, it now takes one second, give or take, because everything runs in parallel. I have a third version which uses non blocking IO and uses fibers. Now, this implementation is quite a bit more complicated. This is going to be a very low-level implementation, talking about fibers, talking about secrets. And typically, you wouldn't really use this kind of implementation in your own uh, project, and instead, you would use a library uh, that abstracts from all this stuff. But I want to show you how you can use fibers for exactly this purpose. So we are going with the low-level implementation. Question number two is that in this implementation, sockets must never block. What I mean by blocking is when you try to read data from a socket and there is no data available, then the entire process or the entire thread will be paused until there is data available on that socket. Now, if you have multiple threads, if you have one thread per socket, that's fine. But this implementation will only use a single thread and instead use uh, non-blocking I.O. and fibers and so on. So we can't allow a socket to block because it would prevent um, us to handle data on sockets that might have data available. So sockets must never block, hence non-blocking I.O. So let's take a look at the implementation. So I have a function called make request fiber. This will return a fiber, and I can call resumant. This is my personal website, which has a very short uh, DNS name, which is pretty cool. This gets my CV. Um, so in the implementation of this function, this gets a host and a path. I will create a fiber, and in that fiber, I will create a non-blocking SSL socket. Now, this is something that I've written myself uh, because I want to spare you of even lower level gory socket details. But you can assume that this is work this is working, and the implementation is actually not that that difficult. I will take this socket and pass it to the connect underscore TCP method or function, which will set up the TCP connection. Once that's done, I will set up an SSL connection on top of it. Finally, I will build an HTTP request message uh, and then write that to the socket. And finally, from that socket, I will read one kilobyte and print out whatever the response is. So at this point, you can check the response code, which for which you would have to parse the HTTP message, the response, and check whether that response is a 200, and then print this is a bad link or whatever, but that's out of scope for now. Let's take a look at connect underscore TCP. So in connect TCP, uh, I will call the method connect TCP on the socket. Now, because this is a non-blocking socket, uh, it might be that there is uh, that it tries to read, but there is no data available. It might also try to write, but the buffer might be full. So in that case, uh, it can operate in two modes. It can either raise an exception or return something. And in this case, I've opted uh, for this method to return something. Specifically, uh, it will return 
the simple weight loss for readable, the, weight loss, the simple weight loss for writable, or something else entirely. So when it returns the symbol weight underscore readable, that means that it wanted to read something, but there was no data available. And so in this case, the only thing that we can reasonably do is to yield the fiber. There's nothing else we can do with this fiber and with this socket. But before we do this, what we have to do is remember that the current fiber is, um, will be suspended because it is waiting for this particular socket. So I have a hash. It is a global, but you can clean up the implementation later. It is a map that maps sockets to fibers, specifically sockets that are waiting to have data available. Let's take a look at what happens when fiber.yield runs. When fiber.yield runs, this uh, resume method returns, and we end up at the very bottom of this piece of code because the fiber got suspended. Now what I will do next is I will call io.select. And io.select takes two arguments, or three or four, yes, yes, yes. In this example, so you can call it with two arguments, which is what I'll do right now. Yes, you are technically correct. I will pass in the list of readable sockets, or the sockets that I want to read from, the sockets that I want to write to, and these are the keys of those two hashes. IO.select will return, or it will wait until at least one of those sockets that I've given to it is readable or writable. And in that case, it will return the list of currently readable sockets and the list of currently writable sockets. The list of readable sockets I can iterate over. I can find the fiber for that socket because there will be one, and I can resume that fiber. And I can do the same for the list of read product writable sockets. So for that, for each writable socket, I find the fiber, and I resume it. And this whole piece of code I have to do over and over again, so hence I put it uh, in a loop. Now, when we call resume on that fiber, we end up right where fiber.yield left off. And at that point, we know that this current socket is no longer waiting to become readable, so we have to remove it from a hash that we just added it to. Let's take a look at the write underscore writable case. This is exactly the same. We call fiber.yield because there's nothing you can do with this fiber that is sensible at this point. We store the current fiber in the, the map of sockets to fibers, but specifically the writable ones. When we come back here, then we have to remove it from that hash. And this, we have to do over and over and over again, so I wrap it in a loop. Now at some point, connect underscore TCP, the method that I call on socket, is actually going to return something else. And in that case, we can break out of this loop, and we have successfully set up the TCP connection. Whew. Connect underscore SSL. Connect underscore SSL will call connect SSL on the socket. Now, because this is a non-blocking socket, it can't wait. And if it were to, if, if it tried to read and there was no data available to read, then it would return something. In this case, wait underscore readable or wait underscore writable or something else entirely. Now, you might have seen this slide before, something very similar. This is what I meant when I said that this is a low-level implementation. In a real-world situation, you would use a library for this, as I mentioned before, and not implement this yourself. So a library that you can use is async, among other things. So you can require it. You can create an endpoint for a particular URL. You can create a client for that thing, and then you say, Asynchronously, I want to do a bunch of things, which is fetching a whole bunch of pages and then printing the status. This, uh, this is a GitHub URL. Uh, I'm not affiliated at all with this project, but I do quite like it. And this async uh, gem uses fibers, uses non-blocking I.O. One thread, you can still do parallel, sorry, concurrent things. 
architecture is important. So with this, we have non-blocking I.O. And this is efficient, efficient non-blocking I.O. So to recap, I gave three examples. The first one was generators, where you could dynamically calculate potentially infinite lists. Number two was resumable computation, where I replaced an exception with uh, something wrapped in a fiber so that I could, could continue the computation later on. And lastly, we have efficient, single-threaded, non-blocking I.O. Before I leave, I want to show you that final slide once again. So you can create a fiber with fiber.new. You can resume a fiber with the resume method. You can yield a fiber with fiber.yield. And now, you know everything about fibers. Thank you. Exceptions behave are as problematic as anywhere else. Um, they don't necessarily uh, require any special handling. Uh, they don't get swallowed uh, like when you use threads. Um, yeah, basically exceptions have the same issues as, as elsewhere. Does that answer your question? The performance increased when you... So instead of having the exception, I'm using the reasonable computation. I did not check. Questions? Challenge me. No questions. Uh, you should yield. I will, I will yield the stage. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much.